Hey, good morning, everybody. 37 more days of this, I'm looking for the ark. Uh, it has been a completely rainy weekend, and um, but we're honored that you loaded in. Thank you for being here today. <laughs> One billion hungry people. That's how many people who in 2030 are projected to be hungry, starving, or significantly malnourished, undernourished. And with the, chur- with the, the churches, the world's population hitting 8 billion people a couple months ago in October, and the current number of undernourished, hungry, starving people today is 850 million. It's a staggering number. It's a staggering number to think that over 10% of our world are aching, just aching. And sometimes we just struggle to comprehend it, but worse, sometimes we just go, well, it's just such a big problem. I'm just one person, and what can I do about it? And, but that's not the response that God's looking for. That's not the response that a follower of Jesus Christ, a person who truly loves Jesus Christ, that's not their response. The response is probably more realistically this. I can't do everything for everyone, but I can do something for some people. That's the thrust of Christian faith. And when we do that, when we help some people with some help, we can help, at least for the individuals, flip their script from hunger to hope. And that's the series we're in that we're wrapping up today. So last week, we looked at the plight of poverty. We looked at four things that God says about poverty in the Bible, themes that come up again and again. We had uh, Bob Cleary from Orphan Network. What a great guy. I mean, as great as he was on stage, you know, behind the scenes, in real life, he's, he's, he's just as great a guy. He really appreciated his time here. Thanks for being such a great guest. I mean, I thought about it. I go, man, we just had this guy fly in on Thanksgiving weekend. He was all, you know, all, all with bells on, really excited about it. So hopefully that was helpful. We learned a little bit about his ministry um, as the executive director of Orphan Network in Nicaragua. Now, today, we're going to share the results from Feed My Starving Children. It's been a busy week. Midweek Thursday, Feed My Starving Children Friday, Feed My Starving Children Saturday, two services Sunday. Nervous breakdown Sunday afternoon. Anyway, so, so today we're going to look at what it's like if we really love people. So take out your notes, open to First John chapter 3. Now, over the years, I've heard people say this, I love people. Uh, it, I mean, I love people. If you only knew how much I love people. I mean, No, they don't say it that way, but it comes across that way. I had an aunt who would always say that. I love you, honey, and no one ever believed her. (laughs) No one ever believed my aunt. I love you, honey. No, you don't. Nobody ever said that, but we all knew it. And there's a lot of people that say they love people. And maybe some of us go, I'm a people person. I love people. Man, you don't even know how much I love people. I love people. But whenever people say that, here's the question. I want them to ask. Here's the question I want to ask of myself, and that's this. How do we know for sure? How do we know for sure that we love people? I mean, it's easy to talk about it, but how do we know? How do you prove it? Well, 1 John chapter 3 is going to help us that way, and it starts in verse 11. So top of your notes, John tells us this. For this is the message you, Christians, in the early church, heard from the very beginning. We should love one another. So he says, this is the message you heard from the very beginning. This is the essence of Christianity. You can't hear hear the message of Christianity without hearing what I'm about to tell you. And that's this. We should love one another. We should love one another. Christianity's always been about love. It's always been about loving people because we love God. Loving people because we love God. Christianity is a faith, a faith based on love because 1 John 4, 16, chapter later in this um, epistle, that's not the gospel of John, it's 1 John, 1 John. It's a letter, a teaching letter, instructional letter. We call it an epistle. 1 John 4, 16 says God is love. Not God is loving, he certainly is, but he is the essence of love. So that means that every true Christian should live a life that is based on love too if we want to be like God. So let's look at what love looks like practically. So let's look at loving people in need, why it happens, how we show it, and, 
And in verses 16 to 24 of 1 John chapter 3, we see four ways we tangibly show love for people in need, material need. One commentary I was looking at and studying this passage says it's a four-point test of our love for people. A four-point test of our love for people. If you do these four things and you say you love people, congratulations. You backed it up. You backed it up. If you say you love people and you're not doing these things, to whatever degree you're not, is to whatever degree maybe you don't love people as much as you really think you do. So let's look at these and ask ourselves, am I doing these things? Are these things happening in my life? Am I showing people this kind of love in my life? So here's the first. The first thing we do when we really love people is we remember Christ's love for us in our need. The more we remember how much Christ loved us in our desperate spiritual need, the more we'll see that we are called to help others whenever we see them in a desperate physical need. There's nothing like helping people when you've been helped. Whenever I've been helped, I always want to be more helping. And it's a great, great feeling. Notice verse 16, 1 John 3, 16. By the way, one quick thing. Study the three sixteens of the New Testament. We all know John three sixteen: for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The three sixteen, Second 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scriptures inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training and righteousness. Study the three sixteens in the New Testament. Look at every one. Not all of them are maybe um, standout-ish, but they're all fantastic. Here's another one. This is how we know what love is. How, John? Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's what love is. What is love? Look at Jesus. Look at what he did. Look at how he voluntarily laid down his life. That's love. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So what's John teaching us here? He's teaching us that Jesus Christ is the inspiration for our love. His love for us, eternal, perfect, magnificent, is the inspiration for our love for others, imperfect, but there. He's also teaching us this fundamental truth. The essence, the essence of love is what? Self-sacrifice for others. The essence of love for others is self-sacrifice for others. Christianity revolves around the self-sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Christians should be characterized by self-sacrifice for others if we're Christians. Christians, Christians means of Christ. So if Christ did that, we want to be of Christ, then we should do that. By the way, hate is the essence of self-serving and having no concern. It's negative. Love is the essence of self-sacrificing. It's filled with concern for others. It's positive. And I say that because I skipped over it, but in verses 12 to 15, John talks about, in contrast to love, what we're talking about here in verse 16, he talks about hate. He uses Cain to do it. First murder in the Bible, Cain murders his brother Abel. And it's an example of hate. Why did Cain do it? Self-serving. Hate is always self-serving. When you hate people, you're self-serving. When you hate people, you're self-serving. I hate them because they did something to me and it's all about me. So hate is always self-serving. Love is always self-sacrificing. I mean, if you get anything, please get that. So when you hate people, you're just serving yourself. When you love people, you're sacrificing yourself. Paul said something similar in Romans 5, 8, a very famous verse, and that it says that God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we we're still sinners, Christ died for us. What a profound verse. What an amazing love. He saw our need. It's all we could do, absolutely 0.0 about it, to change it. And he stepped in the world, self-sacrificed, and demonstrated perfect, amazing love. Where would we be without Christ's love for us? Think about it. Where would you be? Where would I be if you're a Christian? Where would you be if Christ did not demonstrate the perfect love of voluntarily laying down his life on the cross, being nailed to the cross, 
shedding his infinitely precious blood, dying for us. Not because of some cruel, tragic mistake. Oh, there was humans involved and it's a mystery. How did human free will get involved? I, I don't know, but I know this. Jesus Christ said, no one takes my life. I lay it down. Can I tell you where we'd be? And it's not a pretty picture. Christ didn't lay down his life on the cross. We'd still all be in our sin. We'd still be under the penalty of sin, the power of sin. And if Christ didn't demonstrate his perfect love, we stand before a living God and have nothing to say. And if Christ didn't demonstrate his perfect love, we would all have a sentence to eternal damnation. When's the last time you heard that word in church? Damnation. But it's true. We'd go to hell. We'd suffer eternally in the lake of fire. I'm not preaching fire and brimstone. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It's the truth. But he did love us. And he does make the good news available. And if you believe it in your head and receive it in your heart by faith, you avoid this horrific, horrific fate. But it's only made possible because he loved us. Thank God Christ loved us. Now I want to just change the same idea, same thing. How about 850 million? Where would 850 million poor people be without our love? They'd still be in poverty. They'd still be hungry, starving, or undernourished. And they would have absolutely no hope for their earthly life. Can you see the parallel? With Christ's love, we have hope for the afterlife. With our love for the poor, they can have hope for their earthly life. And then if we tell them about Jesus because we helped them with the food, they can have the other too, the hope for the afterlife. We can be like Christ to other people. We'll never do it perfectly. We'll never have to go to the cross to help the poor. We'll have to go to the bank, but we won't have to go to the cross. What Christ did for us spiritually to save us, we can do for others physically to save them from poverty. Never forget Christ's love for you. It will motivate you. We've always seen people become Christians in our church. This year has been fun. It was, we were, you know, we were at a staff meeting uh, last week and found four people became Christians. And I, and I knew some of them. One of them's a, a guy I've known for many, many years who was at our church, became a Christian. Another guy has a Buddhist background. Another one was a kid. Uh, I mean, it was just amazing, amazing, amazing. And God's doing something great here. Um, we've never been the transfer capital of the world. Most churches grow by getting people from other churches. And listen, so if this church is hot, then all Christians leave their church and they go there, and then when that stops being hot, then that's the hot one. I understand all that, look, because I go visit their churches and I see about 50 people who used to attend our church. I mean, it's inevitable. I can't help it. I just look and I see it and I, I try not. But anyway, but here's the thing. We've, we've always prided ourselves in trying to do growth biblically, great commission growth, evangelism growth, reaching people growth. And it's so exciting. I'm talking to some of these people. Some, uh, one person's asking me questions like, like, do you tithe off your income tax return? <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. This person's excited about tithing. Don't let them get around Christians. It'll change quick. I mean, it's, it's scary. They're so excited. They haven't been to church before. They're unchurched, de churched, bad church. It's so many different things. And I'm talking to them, and I'm fired up. We had one that was here all weekend helping out. He came here early Friday, part of the Friday session, went to the second Saturday session, stayed late. I talked with him uh, Friday at the event. Their love for Jesus is so fresh and real and alive, and they're taking Discover Christianity. And Dave Fries, every time he tells me about what's happening at Discover Christianity, I mean, he's ecstatic because he sees what God is doing. And here's my thing. A lot of times when you become a Christian, you're so fired up. And everybody's fired up a different way, but I will say this. If you say you became a Christian and you're not fired up some kind of way, you're, everybody's fired up a little differently, then I'm gonna say I'm not sure you became a Christian because you're fired up. But here's what happens. After a few years, you get around Christians, you know what they do? They tamp it down. Oh, calm down. 
You'll, you'll be normal. And I don't want you to be normal. So here's what I want to say. If you're seeking God, if you're seeking Jesus Christ, we're here to help you find him, help you find him today. You'll avoid hell. You'll be right with God. You'll have a life of meaning. And, and accepting Christ is not just about avoiding hell. It's also about finding meaning and purpose and, and the reason for life. And I hope you'll find him. And then for veteran Christians, when's the last time you just reveled, just absolutely reveled through a party for the amazing love that Jesus Christ demonstrated for you on the cross? Don't ever forget that. If you forget it, I'll introduce you to three or four new Christians in our church. Hang around them for a half hour. They'll fire you up. It's just amazing. Don't ever forget it. Because if you do, if you forget your, the fresh love that Jesus Christ has for you every day, by the way, the Lamentations 3.23, his mercies and love are new every morning. You, you'll never love people. Forget it. Kiss it goodbye. Because if you've forgotten about the love of Jesus Christ, <laughs> can't give what you don't have. Here's a second way we know that we really love people. We relate to people in need with compassion. If we really relate to people in need with compassion, that's love. Look at verse 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity, circle the word pity, come back to it in a minute, has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Implied answer, it can't. It can't. Now, I want to um, ask the team to pull up this graphic I came across yesterday in my research. Look at this graphic over here. This is the distribution of the world's wealth. Looks like a soccer ball. That's the number one sport in the world, by the way. They call it football. We call it football. F-U-T-B-O-L. Anyway, thought that deserved a little more than that. Anyway, this is a little soccer ball. And this is the distribution of the wealth of the world. Watch this. United States, 29% of the world's wealth, about 30%. Asia, altogether, about 38, 39% of the world's wealth. Europe, 24% of the world's wealth, approximately. Do the math. Only 7% of the world's wealth left. Look at that. The blue, Asia. The green, Europe. The red, United States. All right, and you can kind of call the Americas, you know, Mexico maybe, um, New Zealand, you know, however you want it. Look how big the continent of Africa is. Africa has 1.14% of the world's wealth. A continent that big, 1% of the world's wealth. How about Latin America? 2.75% of the world's wealth. So outside of the United States, outside of Asia, outside of Europe, only 7% of the world's, 93% of the world's wealth, Asia, Europe, United States. So when John says, if anyone has material possessions, let's stop right there. Oh, you don't, you don't know me, Vince. I'm broke. I'm broke. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're not broke. You may be in the pokey. You may make a discover every month that you don't like. You may not be the master over your card. You may want a visa out the country when you see your bill. I'm just telling you, you're not broke. The average American adult is worth $550,000. Oh, I'm broke. No, you're not. Your average, you're worth over a half a million. That's your car, your home, your accounts, everything else. So if anyone has material possessions, so here's what I want to say. That's us. That's us. It's all of us. And sees a brother or sister in need. 7% of the wealth outside of Asia, United States, and Europe. A lot of brothers in need. 850 million and growing. But has no pity on them. How can the love of God be in that person? It can't. The word pity, I, I have some congestion because I had a procedure done. Um, you have a nose this big, that's to be expected. Um, the Greek word for pity is splaxna. Splaxna. 
I mean, it's got a G and a, and a Chi and a, and a new, it's, it's Splaxna. I have pity for somebody who tried to say Splaxna. It's the strongest word in the Greek New Testament for the feeling and expression of compassion. It, used, it translates it pity here. But I would say um, pity to me, at least in our English connotation, has the idea. I, I think a better translation is compassion. Again, it's the strongest word. It can be translated heart, bowels, intestines. And it's not talking about body parts. It's just talking about our inner being. Compassion, pity, whatever splaxna comes from our inner being. The love of Christ cannot exist in us if splaxna, compassion, is not coming out of us. It's like the Good Samaritan when he saw his injured neighbor, Luke, 30, Luke 10, 33, 34. But a Samaritan, that is a half Jew, half Gentile, as he traveled, came there and met the man who was injured. And when he saw him, he took splaxna on him. Took pity on same word. And look at the six things he did. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, um, put, on, put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Man, that's practical. He, he, he got down and dirty with it. And if we don't have a heart for people in need, if you don't have a compassion, you can't really love them. He had a pity that led to action which leads to John's third point, verse 18, and that's this. We respond to real needs with tangible action. How do you know you really love people? You respond to real needs with tangible action. So in point one, we remember Christ's love and our need. That's our head. In point two, we relate to people in need with compassion. That's our heart. In this third point, we respond to people's real needs with tangible actions. That's our hands. Our head, where we remember, our heart, where we relate, and our hands, where we respond, that's how you meet needs. That's how you show love. It always starts with our head, remembering Christ's love for us, and then our heart, uh, relating to people and empathizing, sympathizing, and having compassion for their situation, and then responding, opening up my hands here, here. If you were here last week, you heard Bob Cleary tell the story. When Orphan Network started, it was, a, it was a high school group that went to Nicaragua. And they went there to help, and they were so floored by the need. They left everything, everything. They said, this is what I've got here, here. It's all yours. Shoes, I was blown away. I remember when we went to Nicaragua the first time, myself and a, a former member who moved to Virginia, Ken Umke. I don't know if Ken's watching. If you are, hey, Ken and Sandy. Hope you're feeling better, Sandy. Um, we went to the, to the garbage dump, and they warned us. They said, you're going to want to give everything you have right now. You're just going to want to do it. Don't do it. You'll cause a riot. You'll cause problems. I'm telling you, you see it. And you just go, I can't leave here without doing something. That's what John's talking about. So he says in verse 18, dear children, let us not love with words or with speech. Like my aunt, I love you, honey, but with actions and in truth. John's saying, what good is it if it's only your head and remembering and your heart and relating if your hands aren't open? To give. If you only engage your head and your heart, but you don't open up your hands to help the less fortunate, I, 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 could, I tell you the obvious. It doesn't feed a hungry person. It doesn't clothe a destitute person. It doesn't provide shelter for a homeless person. It means absolutely nothing. Nothing. It's not love. You can say you love people, but it's not love, unless it's followed up by helpful actions done with a truthful love. I've often said this, and, 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 and I was at a wedding, and the lady goes, I remember you said that. 
And that was really, I used that in my classroom as a teacher. I used that in my classroom, and, and, and I'm really glad for that. If anything I say that you can use in your profession, that's great. But I, I, I differentiate sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Sympathy says, I'm sorry. Empathy says, I feel your pain. Compassion says, I'm sorry, I feel your pain, I'm going to do something about it. Sympathy and empathy are not enough. Shaking her head, saying ain't that awful, doesn't change a thing. But what does is compassion. Now, the foundation of compassion is your head and your heart, sympathy and empathy. You can't have compassion without sympathy and empathy, but sympathy and empathy alone without compassion Hypocrisy. That's love. James says something similar. James 2, 15 to 17. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. Plight of so many people in our world. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed. In other words, you, you, you just wish them a solution. But you don't provide it, the solution. But does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? Again, in Greek, it demands an answer. The answer is no good. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So James has a broader statement. Faith in Jesus Christ without living for Jesus Christ and doing what Jesus Christ says is an abomination. It's a, it's a it's divorce. It's divorcing what you believe and what you do. Unless we act with practical help, it's really not love for people. At Lakeshore, we try to show real, practical, tangible love for people in need. Our church started with no members, our church started with no money, but a dream to impact the lives of people. I realize that if I say something like this, it can sound braggadocious. I'm not saying it to sound braggadocious. I can be a braggadocious person. I'm trying not to be here. But when we started the church, I had to raise my own support. I had to raise money. I went to churches and got churches, friends, and, and everything, and I, and I had to raise my own support. Before the church fully paid my salary. In other words, I was still raising my own support. We gave money away to missionaries. We just did because we love it. In over 28 and a half year history of Lakeshore Community Church, we've given away $1.3 million. I may not sound like a lot to you. For a church that started with nothing, it's a lot. And now for 12 years, we've packed food and paid for it with Feed My Starving Children. And we did that on Friday and Saturday with about 900 people involved. So here's some of the numbers from Feed My, and some of the nice pictures too. Look at that. Let's see if we can pull up some of the numbers. We, had, we actually had 560 volunteers. Must have got rained out. I don't know, maybe I missed. 560 volunteers. Woo, we're supposed to only pack 163. 171,288 meals packed. By the way, that brings our total to 2.2 something million in 12 years. And then the final number, 469 kids fed for a whole year. 469 human beings will eat for a whole single year. That is a pretty amazing weekend. It's an amazing weekend. Absolutely amazing, amazing weekend. I want just, I just, all right, you look here, look here. I, I just want you to look at that number. And I want you to look at that sentence and take it in. 469 precious human beings that Jesus Christ shed his blood for and died for are going to eat that would not have eaten had the last two days not happened. Now, what have I said? If it's just your head, and it's just your heart, and you're not opening up your hands, that's not love. So let me just talk turkey here. Packing for food is one thing. Paying for it's another. I know, call me a, call me a pessimist, I know a lot of people came here, they pack food, they're not going to support it financially. They feel better. They got a picture. It's on social media now. So... I, I can't help that. <laughs> you like that, Chuck? Thanks. Somebody had to help me out. Anyway, I'm just telling you. And if that's what they want to do, that's, that's all they can do. That, I don't know what the reason is. I'm, I, you know. 
But I do know this. I hope it's not you because that's where Making Waves 2024 comes in. Making Waves 2024 is how we fund Feed My Starving Children. Since 2011, we have given significant amount of money to missions. Of the 1.3 million, a lot, most of it is through Making Waves 2024. It's our annual impact opportunity to give tens of thousands of dollars away to people every year. This year, we say it's 75,000. <laughs> It'll be at least 80, I promise. And this year, as you um, grab one of these brochures, I hope you will, and read it over, you're basically giving to five projects. The first, of course, Feed My Starving Children. That event cost us $45,000. How many, how many churches would do this? Go, well, we don't have the money, but we're going to do an event that costs $45,000. We back it up. We trust that people are going to respond. $45,000 will go to Feed My Starving Children. The second thing it goes to is Orphan Network. And we, I mentioned Bob Cleary in Nicaragua, second poorest country. $12,000 will go to them. Um, in 2024. The third, fourth, and fifth projects combined are about $23,000, and they're usually a little more. And they involve the Serve Initiative, things like Love Week and helping people. We have, that's our fund to do all the projects that we do to just show the love of Jesus Christ to people all over Rochester. Streets for Christ. It's an exciting ministry that we've been involved in the last year or two. And in Streets for Christ, we help the homeless with food and, and, and sometimes clothes. And, you know, we're all like, man, it's been miserable out. You know, imagine being homeless this weekend. That's not, oh, you almost rather have it snow. Don't tell anybody I said that. And we help them. We're funding that. Every Friday night, group is going out looking for people. They know where to find them. And helping homeless be under bridges, I, I've seen it. And then finally, for various projects that come up. We, we do all this by faith. We just trust God. So we're asking everyone at Lakeshore to be a part. If you're online, we're asking you to consider being a part. Will you? If you really love people, I hope you'll be a part. But it's totally your decision. So what am I asking you to do? Number one, grab a brochure. Number two, just read it. It's not that long. It's real short. Number three, ask this question, Lord, what do you want me to do with all that you've given me to help the poor? Doesn't matter what I think. Doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. The only thing that matters is what God thinks. You don't have to please me. Who cares about me? You don't have to please anybody else. Who, at the end of the day, you just got to ask, you got to, it's a bold question. It's a bold question because you ask God what he wants you to do. He might tell you something that you're not ready to do. But you do it anyway. And then third, just, um, it's a self-contained. It's got the information. You just get this card, tear it off. If God leads you, include an upfront gift with it or uh, not. And then make a commitment monthly for the rest of the year. You can also give through Making Waves dot info, makingwaves.info, that's up on the screen. You can also give on the kiosks if you just want to do a one-shot thing. We're not here to tell you what to do. We're here to give options. So will you be a part? Will you show your love to needy people with your money through Making Waves 2024? It's your call. But there's one last point that John makes in this passage about real love looks like, and it's this. Realize is really obedience to God. Loving people in need is really obedience to God. Loving people with our head, as we remember, with our heart, as we relate, and with our hands, as we respond, are all acts of obedience, all things God calls us to do. We realize that God calls us to do it, and then when we respond, we prove our love for God and for people. 1 John 3, 19 to 24 ends with a long extended passage. Let me break it down kind of in two sections. Let me start with verses 19 to 22. John says, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. 
the things we just talked about. And then he says this, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Then he gives the other extreme. If our dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. We receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what he pleases. That's a lot there. But let me tell you what he's fundamentally saying. He's fundamentally saying is sometimes our heart, our conscience, if you will, sometimes says, oh, you know what? You should have done something. But the truth is, God says, maybe you shouldn't have. So you feel bad inside for false reasons. And John says the answer is, do you love God? He's greater than your heart. God is greater than your heart. God is greater than your feelings. And then he says, but if your heart doesn't condemn you, that's even better because you don't need God to confirm that your heart's good, you're good. And it's all good because you obey God. Obeying God is always greater than how your heart feels. Look how rainy it is today. Look, our tennis is a little down in this service. You can tell why. People are like, I don't feel like going to church today. Well, sometimes you got to act your way into a feeling. How many know what I'm talking about? A lot of people, well, I don't feel. Well, do it anyway. I don't feel like going to work. Well, I, I feel like getting the check, though. So I go. <laughs> yeah. And then in the second part, 23 and 24, he says, and this is the command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. That's the summary of the passage right there. That's it right there. What's the passage? You could say this and that, pity, splocks, and all that. Here's what it is. Believe in the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Love one another as he has commanded us. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him. In other words, if you're doing this, helping the poor, doing everything that the Bible says, you're in Christ. If you're not doing it, you're not that you lost your salvation, you're just, you're not in close union with Christ is the idea. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. So simply obey God's command to believe and trust in Christ and practically love people. And you'll never have to worry about your heart condemning you, never. At the end of the day, as I wrap up, I just want to say this. John is telling us, do two things in your life. Believe in and receive Christ truthfully. Make sure you're really a Christian. And then number two, love people around you tangibly. And I hope we'll do this. I hope you'll do this. I know Sue and I will do this. And I hope Making Ways 2024 will be a means to continue to help people. Let me close with this verse. It's Proverbs 19:17. It's a great verse. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Isn't that good? Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Now, if you lend to the Lord, what does that mean? A loan means it's going to be paid back. He was kind, lends to the Lord, and he, the Lord, will reward them, the person who's kind to the poor, for what they have done. When you give to God, whether it's making waves, whether it's Lakeshore, any Christian godly organization you give to, God's gonna reward you for that. He's got a special reward for helping the poor. One day, whatever good we've done to help the poor, God's gonna give it right back to us. Oh, well, I don't think God remembers... Oh, he remembers everything. He sees it all. And one day, I don't know if this will happen, but it might, we'll die. We'll stand before the living God. If you're a Christian, you'll be forgiven. You've been forgiven. You'll be given your rewards. It'll be one of the five or five crowns, and like we've been studying at Revelation, you'll take it off and you put it at the Lord's feet and worship him because he's the one who allowed you to do those good things. And then you're going to stroll around heaven. I say stroll. I don't know what you're going to do. Right? You're going to be around heaven, and then somebody's going to come up to you. Sir, sir. I mean, they, we probably know each other's names. I don't know. He'll go, Vince, yeah. I want to thank you. What? Why? What did I do? Well, you gave that shoebox. You gave to Making Waves. You help the poor, 
that came to my country, and God helped me understand that you gave to that. It helped my physical need. It helped me find Jesus Christ, and I'm in heaven in the natural because of your gift. Thank you for giving to the Lord. That's what Jesus means when he says, um, um, give and you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. I think the idea is welcomed not only by God, because he repays the poor, those who give to the poor, but also by others. What a great feeling. What a great feeling it would be. And when that day comes, we will realize how great it is to give to those in need. So let's bow our heads. And so I just want to ask you just a gut check question, and, and, and it's fundamentally this. Do you really love people? Do you really love people? You go, I, I, I want to. I, I think I do. I want to. Then all I could say is, let's look at these four things John said. Do you remember Christ's love for you? Do you relate to people in need because you're in need spiritually, they're in need physically maybe? Do you respond with an open hand? And do you realize that whenever you do what you do for the poor, you're doing it to obey the God who sends poverty and sends wealth? It's not a test you take and pass and that's it. It's a test you continually take every day of your life. Remember what we said last week? It's not just an event. It's a lifestyle. Father, help us to have a lifestyle of helping the poor. It's not just today. It's not just making waves 2024. It's every day. Oh, we'll make some mistakes. We'll give to somebody and they'll buy drugs or bottle of booze, but we should certainly use discernment, but help us to have a lifestyle. And if you don't have that lifestyle, maybe it's because you don't have the one who gives love. You can't have love until you know love, and God is love, and Jesus Christ is love, and he loves you. And if you don't love, it's because perhaps you don't have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You can have one. And you can have meaning and purpose in this life and avoid eternal damnation in the next, but eternal bliss with God. Just say, Jesus Christ, I believe that you're God. I know that you died for my sins, past, present, and future sins. And I have many of them. I'm a sinner, stem to stern. I believe in you. I put my trust in you. I receive you by faith alone. Come into my life. Make me a brand new person. And if you say that and you mean it with all of your heart and you fling your complete trust and faith on the finished, paid work of Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Let us know about it. And Father, I pray for Making Waves 2024. I pray the results would be staggering, the poor would be helped, and you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.